I'm Ann Mason, and I'm a member of the Program Committee for the National Railway Historical Society's Washington, D.C. chapter. I'm moderating this session tonight. And tonight, I'm assisted by Darren Goldsmith and Jim Perry. Our chapter's mission is to expand the public appreciation of railroads and their history through preservation and education. We accomplish this mission through a variety of programs, including sponsoring a scholarship to rail camp for a high school student, operating three rail cars, including the two N cars and our beloved 1923 Pullman car, the Dover Harbor, maintaining a railroad library at Louis Tower, Maryland, and publishing our monthly newsletter, The Timetable. Another way we fulfill our mission is by offering free public programs, including tonight's event. Now, personally, I love to visit the seashore in the late summer and early fall. The weather is beautiful and the sizzling hot days have transitioned to warm days and cooler nights and there is less crowds. This is a perfect time to go to the beach. Tonight, Mike Sweeney, president of the Friends of the Chesapeake Beach Railway Museum and Kareen Moore, administrative aide for the Railway Museum will take us on a virtual tour to their favorite beach, including a history of the railway and fun at the boardwalk and museum. But just a point of note, after a long COVID nap, the museum is now reopened. So we hope that you will enjoy Mike's virtual tour and that you'll be encouraged to take a ride to Chesapeake Beach and visit in person. And now, if you're ready, Mike, take us to the beach. Over to you. Thank you, Ann. Okay, and what we're going to talk about this evening, well, first off, thank you, Ann, and all of you for giving us the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, it, it isn't very often that we get to showcase our museum and the town of uh, Chesapeake Beach. So um, like the slide says, it'll be a short history of the short-lived Chesapeake Beach Railway and the long-lived Chesapeake Beach Resort Town. And this is the lineup. Now, this is an interesting slide. Um, oh, about three years ago, the museum and our curator then, Carrie Crane, and the friends decided to hire a company to come in and give us an assessment of our museum and recommend improvements. Um, it was pretty static all the time. Um, same stuff year, over year after year. So this company came in, they were from New Jersey and they came down and they said, wow, you've got some tremendous potential here. This is, this is just a great place, great character and a great story to tell. And we have some recommendations. So their recommendations, as you can see, um, was to break the story up into three main parts, the dream, the journey, and the destination. And the, the last one there, the Doppler effect, that's a little bit of editorial license on my part. And on the next slide, these are the references that we use to build this presentation. On your left is uh, Ames Williams' book, which is our Bible, and there's a copy on the, on the desk. Um, we reference it a lot with visitors that come in, ask questions, and we're able to it, you know, go right to the book. And the, the book on the right is called The Catechism of the Locomotive. Now, this is a really awesome book. The one that's pictured here is an original that was given to me by my daughter on Christmas a couple of years ago, well, she, five years ago. But anyway, it, um, she gave me this copy. It's an original uh, in 1879 version there. And she also gave me a reprint, one that I could, uh, 
I could work through and uh, wouldn't have to damage it. But this is a prize. And it, it, the title of the thing it kind of, I didn't understand it. Why a catechism of locomotive? A catechism was something that when we were young in the church, that the, the catechism was something that we, we memorized in order to you know, be, be confirmed. But when I researched it, catechism is nothing more than a style of presentation of information. And this style is question and answer. In the 500, excuse me, 609 pages of the catechism of the locomotive, there are 563 questions. And the answers are quite detailed. When a, when a man went to work for the railroad, he was given a copy of Forney's and he read and read and read. And when it was time for him to move from maybe a, a brakeman to a fireman, he interviewed with the chief engineer and the chief engineer could ask him any question in the catechism. And if he came up with all of the, the right answers of the questions, they saw fit to promote him. And uh, it, is, uh, it is an awesome book. And um, I don't want to say anything about um, my uh, ADHD or anything like that, but I read this thing from cover to cover, and it was awesome. And I was also intrigued by the language that they used uh, back in, in the 1870s, 1880s. In particular, this book right here on the uh, inside of the, of the cover, it's uh, from um, a man to his grandson and it's dated 1880. So, you know, if, if my house catches on fire, this will be the first thing that I get out, you know, and the rest of the place can go. Okay, on the next slide is a little bit about our museum here. This is us, and um, this uh, you can obviously read. And it's an interesting place. Uh, when we started to redo and update the museum, something that was firm uh, to management from the friends and the folks that work there and everything was uh, new exhibits are great, but we will not stand for a loss of character of the building. And that building, when you walk through the front door, you're walking from 2021 to 19 and something, 20 something. And we were able to keep that with the restoration and uh, the new exhibits. It's the, the museum itself is not owned by the county. It is leased to the county by the property owners of the Rod and Reel. And that's where this thing sits on their property. And it's leased to the county for $1 a year on a 99 year lease with the strict stipulation that if for some reason the county decides that they don't want to staff it or maintain it, the building does go back to the Rod and Reel Resort. Okay, um, and the next slide, here's a quick timeline. This is very interesting um, to us railroad folks. Um, to your left, the Washington Chesapeake Railway Company was chartered 1891, but the next item there, in 1894, the town of Chesapeake Beach was incorporated. It wasn't the town with its 294 people back then. It wasn't the town that petitioned the state government to incorporate the town. It was the Washington and Chesapeake Railway Company. They petitioned the state and the state granted a charter to incorporate the town of Chesapeake Beach. And um, when we talk about this to visitors, they say, well, that was really nice of them. Well, it wasn't really nice. They had an ulterior motive and their ulterior motive was politics because they could go to the town leadership and say, guys, if it wasn't for us, you wouldn't exist. So they almost wanted to hold it as like a cudgel 
over them. Um, but uh, that, that was the, the, the mood back then. Also, um, and I saw a publication, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it, would, it said, you know, uh, in like a, a, a sort of private conversation, you know, we own the town. Th these are railway people talking. We own the town and we own the county. And, uh, you know, we pretty much can uh, do what we need to do. So uh, there's your timeline, the, the main events. Uh, the first uh, revenue service actually started 1898. And it began between uh, Marlboro, Upper Marlboro and Hyattsville. Um, Upper Marlboro is exactly the one half point in between, excuse me, in between Sea Pleasant and, um, and, and the beach. But anyway, they, uh, they got the line finished uh, 1898 and started running freight in between Upper Marlboro and uh, Hyattsville and vice versa. And then in 1900, the resort opened. And um, that's kind of the mark people ask. They say, when did it start running here? The operative word here, and that is that it started running here, Chesapeake Beach, 1900. And went on till 1935. And in, in the, the title slide, you know, the short lived Chesapeake Beach Railway and the long lived Chesapeake Beach town. So that's that's where that comes from. Oh, Horace Greeley, uh, you know, smart guy. Go West, young man. That's what guys were, were going to do. They're going out there and make their fortunes. And the last sentence, they were looking to get richer by going to where the money was, the East Coast. These two pictures you're looking at were actually artist renditions of buildings they wanted to build but they were from the original Washington Chesapeake Beach Railway. They, um, they said, we are gonna build this grand resort down on the, on the Chesapeake Bay. And um, this is what uh, our, our two main uh, hotels and casinos will look like. There's Otto, Otto Mears. Otto Mears was a Russian. He was born in Russia at age two. When he was two years old, he was orphaned. And he was uh, moved to an uncle's place in Russia. And at age 10, the uncle said, I, I can't be doing this. So he got sent to England and lived with another uncle there uh, for a while. It's, it's not clear as exactly how old he was but he came to the United States on a, on a uh, boat, you know, um, to, into New York City where he had a, another cousin that was there that took him in. And he stayed there for a while. And then his cousin arranged for another family member in San Francisco to uh, take him in. So Otto was uh, back, on the, back on the high seas and then he went to San Francisco via the Isthmus of Panama. And he got to uh, San Francisco uh, pretty, pretty much penniless and uh, got to work uh, there at odd jobs. He was a tinsmith, a couple other things. And then the Civil War broke out. He said, I'll, I'll go into the Army. So he went into the Army in California and um, was in the army about eight months. And it looked like uh, the army, well, the army says, hey, the civil war is not coming this far. So uh, we're gonna have you doing other things. So um, he, uh, in his, his army unit, they went out into the desert and were battling the uh, Native Americans there. Uh, and he did that and was finally discharged in 1864. He's, uh, he got around quite a bit. He got wind of the Washington Chesapeake Beach Railway Company um, and what they were going to do. And he said that would be something. And in the meantime, he had, he had set to work. He was building railroads in Colorado and, and um, throughout the West there. Um, but he made it back to, the, to uh, Chesapeake Beach, looked around and said, this, this has potential. 
he went back to Colorado and looked up three friends of his, David Moffat, Charles Popper, and John McNeil. Uh, David Moffat uh, was a transplant from New York, and he was a banker in New York City. When I say banker, he was somebody that worked in a bank. He wasn't an official or anything like that. And then he moved west to Denver and uh, got involved in banking there. And uh, he uh, also, excuse me, he also saw that railroads were starting to build up out there. And he invested in them, got involved in them, and he um, became quite rich in assisting with uh, building railroads. His friend, uh, Charles Popper, he came to Denver from Germany. He was actually a German. And he and Otto Mears were good friends uh, because they were both foreigners and both spoke with accents. So they kind of, uh, you know, uh, commiserated uh, about their toughness or their, their difficulty in speaking. But um, he eventually ended up living in Salt Lake City and he was also in, uh, in the banking business. The fellow on the right there, John McNeil, he was another New Yorker that went west. He was uh, living in a place called Owego, um, New York. And uh, he, uh, he actually, there's a railroad up there, runs between Owego and uh, Cooperstown. And um, I had the opportunity to run, a, uh, run an engine up there between Owego and uh, Cooperstown a bunch of years ago. But anyway, he landed in Denver and uh, he ended up, um, he was a banker also, and he ended up uh, owning a bank in Denver. And uh, then he moved on and bought a, uh, owned a bank in a place called Del Norte um, in, in Colorado. He also invested in mines and cattle and cattle and uh, wagon roads and, and things like that. So these guys, they were, they were rich and they were friends of Otto's and Otto convinced them to help finance the Chesapeake Beach Railway Company. And what, what we have difficulty understanding was that the resort was the main reason that all the building went on. And that was, that was you know, the, the prime reason that they were Chesapeake Beach was the resort. The railroad, it was just a means to get people to the resort. And that's the way they looked at it. But when the railroad started running, they said, well, we can make some more uh, revenue from freight and, you know, other things. And uh, they did. Not a whole lot, but uh, uh, the um, agriculture down in Calvert County, uh, they used the railroad quite a bit to get their goods up into Washington, D.C. Now, of the three, David Moffat was the most prominent. And on the next slide, you'll see just how prominent he was. He was one of the most prominent uh, men in Colorado back in the day there. And there is even a, a county named after him, Moffat County. And we're all familiar with the Moffat Tunnel. Uh, the picture you're looking at is the East Portal. But there was also, and this map shows it, uh, the Moffat Road. And uh, of course, uh, he uh, invested, uh, had that road built, but in addition, he, uh, he made sure that the tunnel uh, was built. Uh, Moffat County used to be a piece of another county, but the county, that other county was uh, too big uh, to manage. It was pretty lawless. So the state of Colorado broke it in half and um, Moffat uh, became its own county. And uh, it's, it's located in the uh, north, the total, the, the, the very north and very west corner of Colorado. And, uh, and in 2020, its population uh, was uh, 13,200 people. But then um, they're spread over 4,700 square miles. So I, I don't think it's uh, as cosmopolitan as, as we would think. But uh, again, uh, David Moffat, still to this day, his name is uh, 
uh, recognizable and his influence uh, was, he just left a lot of uh, legacy there in Colorado. And on our next slide, we'll talk about the first of the three areas that our museum is interested in, and that is the journey. And sometimes that was the adventure. We could talk about quite a bit about the journey. Obviously steamboats and Baltimore trains and cars from DC, uh, Chesapeake and, and getting back home again. And our next slide shows us, it's, it shows us the, the uh, railway. And this railway runs from Chesapeake Junction uh, in Washington, DC. You'll see it the uh, number one there on the left and uh, all the way down uh, through Prince George's, a little bit of Anne Arundel, a little bit of Calvary County down into Chesapeake Beach. There were uh, 15 places, I will say, where the, where the train could stop. Five of them, uh, five of those 15, I call them places, uh, were railway stations. The rest of them were just maybe uh, a shelter and kind of like today's buses, um, someone would be standing there, wave at the train, the train would stop, pick them up, or someone needed to get off. So uh, it ran through uh, a lot of rural country, and um, there are uh, just a, a legion of stories about what went on on the railroad. And uh, next slide here, we'll talk about the train itself. When it was at peak operation, uh, they ran about five trains a day. They ran five trains and about 1,500 people a day on those trains. And your second bullet's interesting because the um, Chesapeake Junction in DC, that's still referred to on CSX today. You hear it on the radio is I'm at Chesapeake Junction. So it, it still exists. For um, you aficionados uh, that like to deal with numbers, uh, on this, the second uh, item there was 32 miles in Chesapeake Junction. It really wasn't, it was uh, 31.866 miles, uh, but we rounded it to 32 for clarity. And uh, the 29 miles from the district line station at Chesapeake Beach was actually 28. Point 529, in case you're interested, uh, just what you want to hear on a Friday night. Uh, train, uh, it took about one hour, 30 minutes, actually, on the timetable of the uh, the official timetable that's in the Ames Williams book. It was uh, the average, or not the average, but the normal local train was an hour and 20 minutes. And um, uh, I divided, uh, did the math, and uh, it was, uh, it averaged out to 23 miles an hour the speed. Um, so, on, you know, I, I, truth in advertising, average speed of 15 to 20. Um, the ruling grade was 1.8%, uh, and that was near Ritchie Station. And something, I did a study about how these places got their names, and they were usually named for the farm uh, that where they purchased the uh, right-of-way uh, through there. So this was uh, some gentleman named Richie. I have his first name somewhere, but uh, that's that's how they got their names. Six overpasses, 30 bridges or trestles. Um, the longest trestle that existed on the, uh, on the road was uh, 600 feet. That's quite a trestle. And it went, up, it, uh, it went across the, um, the uh, swamp there down near, near Chesapeake Beach. Uh, interestingly, uh, state roads came to the railway in right, 1930 and said, we want to build a road underneath your trestle here. And um, uh, the Chesapeake Beach Railway said, well, sure, go right ahead. And the state road said, well, we don't like to build roads under wooden trestles. Uh, they, the abutments will have to be concrete. And uh, the uh, railway went back to the state and said, well, 
good, go, go ahead and you guys build the concrete um, abutments. We're not doing it. So those two abutments are still standing today. And when, uh, if you're traveling south on Route 4, Pennsylvania Avenue extended, and you take the exit to Chesapeake Beach on the uh, exit ramp, when you come up and back over Route 4, you can see the two abutments still there. And they, they ran a road uh, underneath of that. Um, and um, it, it was infamous, actually. The road had a sharp curve. People didn't slow down. They were getting killed right and left on that curve. Um, the mandatory mail stops, Upper Marlboro, mile, mile post 14, and uh, owing to 26.6. And uh, the mile posts were from uh, Chesapeake Junction. So they, they, they had to carry mail. Uh, as an aside, the mail came actually from Hyattsville. Uh, another train ran to Hyattsville, picked up the mail, and brought it to uh, Seat Pleasant, actually. And that's where it, it got distributed to Upper Marlboro and Owens. And down in Upper Marlboro, it connected with the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, and the CSX Pokes Creek, which runs coal down to, uh, down to Chalk Point Power Plant and Morgantown Power Plant, uh, they use it every day, but uh, that, um, that was uh, where Chesapeake Beach Railway connected with the then Pennsylvania Railroad. And it's still, if you, uh, if you use your imagination when you're down there walking around, you can still see where the, uh, where the connection was. Very interesting. And um, the Pennsylvania line was there first, and Chesapeake Beach Railway said, well, we're going to cross your, your uh, line here, your road. And um, um, Pennsylvania said, that's great, but you're not going to cross it with wooden anything over our tracks. So the Chesapeake Beach Railway built a, an overpass, if you will, over top the Pennsylvania. And uh, it's uh, 31 feet tall. I forget exactly how, how long it is, but it was concrete and steel. Um, and uh, accounts about the ride, it was noisy, dirty, shaky, generally uncomfortable. And the engine burned about 1,000 pounds of coal, 1,000 gallons of water each way. And I got those figures, of the 1,000 and 1,000, they're round, of course. But uh, I, I got that from research in uh, Forney's, from Forney's Catechism of the Locomotive. The, um, the majority of the engines, and we'll see later, were uh, 440s, and they had a... Uh, a diameter of their pistons of 16, a stroke of 24. And um, it's all in formulas in the, in the Forney's Catechism. Not bad for 1880-something. And uh, here's one of the engines. This is number 12. They had nine 440s. Um, of the nine, two of them were built, were built by the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, five of them were built by Pittsburgh locomotive company, and two of them were Baldwin's. Um, and then they had two four six O's. One of them was built by Brooks and the other by Baldwin. And then the two eight O's, both of those were Baldwin's. Now, engines number one and number two, and they were sequential as they were purchased. They were purchased new. And then after, you know, three, four, and on up the line, those engines they were bought secondhand. And uh, on the next slide here, we'll see the rest of their rolling stock. And of course, there's the 13 locomotives up there. Now, right, that second bullet, that's interesting. The Brill Gas Electric Rail Car. Um, I didn't have room to put it on this slide, but uh, they said, originally, Otto Mears said, this should be an electrified railway. And we foresee trains running as fast as 60 miles an hour. You know, he was a, a dreamer. But uh, they purchased a Brill gas slash electric rail car. And it turned out to be a maintenance nightmare. And uh, they got rid of it after about two years. 
uh, the thing would break down, you know, whenever it felt like it. It wasn't dependable at all. But they had a, a pulling contest between the uh, a steam locomotive and the Brill car help it see pleasant. They put them side by side. Um, I can't say a pulling contest, but uh, because the um, the steam engine, it, it was running light, just an engine and a, and a uh, tender, and then the Brill car. But <clears throat> the Brill car, you know, took off like, you know, really, really well while the uh, steam engine uh, stayed, stood there and spun its wheels and everything. And uh, what the public didn't know was that before the contest, uh, someone uh, who was uh, encouraging purchase of more Brill cars, uh, someone had greased the wheels, the drivers underneath of the uh, steam engine. And we even have film of that. It's pretty cool. Um, there's this engine just sitting there spinning its wheels and the Brill car is taken off. Anyway, they had a, a baggage car, coach cars and all that stuff. That picture uh, that you see underneath or at the bottom of the page, that's a number 11, that's a combination car. And I, uh, the automobile next to it, I don't know what that is. But, Mike, um, there, Mike, let me interrupt. There's a question yes, specifically about the Brill car. Yes. And the question is, where did it get its electricity? Oh, it was uh, generated by itself. It, it had a gas engine that ran a generator and then the, the uh, wheels were turned by electric motors. It was self-sustaining. And there's another question about the gauge of the railroad. Standard gauge. Okay, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Four feet, eight and a half inches. Did I do good? Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. All righty. Um, the little, the little um, hop mail car um, or the inspection car, uh, that was uh, Eugene. And uh, that thing looked like a little station wagon on, you know, with, uh, with uh, railroad wheels on it. And it was powered by a Ford model, little four cylinder model T engine. And um, they used it every now and then, uh, even run mail um, if, something, if something had to get down the road. Okay, and we're going to look at steamboats next. This way of getting to Chesapeake Beach, they they it had its own uh, it had its own story. Um, uh, you can see the lights in the on the left hand side. You see the photograph. That's the Light Street Pier uh, in Baltimore. Right now, that's uh, the Inner Harbor, uh, pretty much. Um, but. Uh, they had steamboats going everywhere from White Street Pier. Uh, they would go to the other side of the bay up near Baltimore to uh, resorts over there, uh, up and down the uh, west uh, side of the bay, and uh, a couple of places on the eastern eastern shore. Um, carried about 3,500 passengers a day peak season. And there was this very, very long pier and the, the, the center picture and the picture on the right, I wanted to put those in. Uh, the center picture shows you the size of those boats. They were not small. They were huge, which supports the picture on the right. You see this gigantic ship sitting way out in the bay. That's because the bay was extremely shallow. Well, it still is. And... Um, that fellow there, he's probably sitting in about maybe 19 feet of water as far out as he is. Now, this picture was taken in uh, 1931 or so, and uh, you see the two tracks on the pier. And um, they did have a small train that ran um, because it was such a long walk from the boat to the shore. And in August and the way they were dressed, it was not, not nice at all. So the first one, the first engine they had was a, a little, um, uh, a little uh, steam engine, excuse me. And uh, then they eventually went uh, to a gasoline powered little engine there. Um, and people, uh, visitors to the museum 
they look at that and say, oh my gosh, you know, I said, well, that was kind of a good thing. And that two and a half to three hour ride from White Street down to Chesapeake Beach, everybody was partying on that boat. And the guys on the boat, um, they probably had a jug or two um, that they carried on board. And they, they, they were drinking and partying all the way down, dancing and all that, having a great time. Well, when they got to Chesapeake Beach, they uh, weren't in the best of shape. Uh, but uh, having to walk that long pier in the hot sun, that helped civilize them a little bit. So when they got on dry land, they were pretty docile. And um, an another thing I want to mention is the Wilson line. Um, on the second bullet there, multiple boats from the Wilson line. And now I, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I remember riding the Wilson line from Main Street Pier down to uh, Mount Vernon and uh, Charlotte, uh, Mount Vernon, I think it was Charlotte Hall. There was an amusement park down there. But anyway, um, when people see photographs of the Wilson line boat, um, they don't realize that Wilson line was like American Airlines. Wilson Line had boats in Washington, Baltimore, all the way up to Philadelphia, but they all had this huge Wilson Line. And people say, wow, I rode the Wilson Liner in, when it was in Washington or out of Washington. But that, that's a bit of a misnomer. Each boat from the Wilson Line had their own name, uh, the state of Delaware, uh, the, you know, and, and stuff like that. So. Uh, that was, it's just a little misunderstanding that everybody has. Yeah, I rode the Wilson Liner. Okay. Automobiles. I, I don't know if you all can, maybe you can. Can everyone see the caption underneath of that? And that tells the story underneath the photograph. And, uh, you know, Chesapeake Beach, uh, this is circa, what, 1925 or so. And, but you see the proliferation of automobiles there. And uh, the automobile and the truck are pretty much what led to the demise of the, of the railway. Um, you can see people, they had their own cars. They could go wherever they wanted to. They didn't necessarily have to be go to Chesapeake Beach. Um, and ridership fell off uh, quite a bit. Um, and trucks could transport uh, agriculture up into Washington, D.C. Um, and um, didn't have to wait for the train or hope there'd be room or that kind of stuff on the, for the train. <laughs> now, it's interesting. When the, when the Chesapeake Beach Railway was, was running, they actually, they did two things that didn't help them. They carried a lot of tools and even... Um, uh, paving material on the train to assist Maryland build roads down in Anne Arundel and Calvert County. Well, mostly Anne Arundel. And um, so while they were making a little bit of money, they were also sealing their own fate by helping to build roads. Uh, the other thing it's, it's, it's kind of interesting is that in Owings, there was a shop there um, that assembled transmissions for cars. Chesapeake Beach Railway would drop off, you know, pallets and pallets of pieces of transmissions for automobiles, and they'd be assembled in a shop down there and then put back on the train, headed back north to, I don't know where, where the cars were eventually assembled. But um, again, it was another thing that was adding to the, to the death of the, uh, of the railway. Uh, a car ride um, to Chesapeake Beach, uh, I, I got to thinking about it a couple of days ago and I wrote it down from Seat Pleasant, you went out Old Marlboro Pike, uh, bumped all the way down there through Upper Marlboro, and then you cross the Patuxent River at Hills Bridge, which is still there, just bigger. Um, and then into Wason's Corner and through Wason's Corner up, up into Lothian there. Um, and then you turned right and picked up Solomon's Island Road. And that went south and you ended up in Owings. 
But then at Owings, you took uh, another road. I don't remember the name of it. You ended up on a place called Cox Road. And Cox Road eventually led into um, Chesapeake Beach. Uh, but my, what I'm saying is that those roads were unpaved. And it was a tough ride. I don't know how many flat tires people got on the way down there. But it was a long, dusty uh, dirty road. And if you look closely at the cars in the parking lot here, you see none of them were very, if any, had uh, windows in them. That's just the way they were. Enough about cars. All right. Let's talk about the destination. Away from the city, more water in one place than we have ever seen. Mike's Breeze is lots of fun stuff to do. But Chesapeake Beach back then, it was a great place to come and all that, get the heck out of town. You know, we, we all know what Washington, D.C. summers are like. Get down on the bay. But well, Chesapeake Beach was kind of like Las Vegas is today. We go down there and uh, forget about life for a while, have a good time. It was wild and woolly. And uh, there was uh, quite a bit of uh, drinking going on. And uh, there were quite a few drunks. And... Um, you know, people just kind of, um, they figured they were in Las Vegas. What went on? Chesapeake Beach stayed in Chesapeake Beach. Uh, all kinds of stuff going on down here, along with the, uh, the family, the family fun. And um, I, I read an account once of two things. And, and, and these, these to me are, are kind of cute and funny. And that is that on Monday mornings, there were plenty of people wandering around that didn't live there. And what they had done is they had stayed the weekend down there, got all drunk up and couldn't make the Sunday night train back to D.C. And they were stuck and they were wandering around until the first train could go back to Washington, D.C. I don't know how many lost their jobs over that, but uh, that wasn't unusual to find uh, these, these lost, hungover souls wandering around. And... Um, an account of one of the, from one of the conductors, he said that the ride back from Chesapeake Beach on Sunday night was the worst. Uh, uh, guys that, uh, that did make it, they were um, not in the best of moods. Um, they were probably still a little bit or, or inebriated, but uh, one account from a, conduct, a conductor he got into an argument with this man dragging this huge fish aboard on the train. And uh, the conductor said, you know, get that stinking fish off my train. Blah, 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 blah. Well, the guy ended up using the fish as kind of a club and uh, hit the conductor with it, knocked him down. And uh, it's, that's kind of the stuff that went on. But there were lots of amusements, entertainment there. Um, the dance pavilion, that was very, very popular down there. Uh, a lot of music. Uh, in the center is the band shell. And we have a, a picture in the museum. And I don't think this is the one, but it's uh, there was a huge trained bear that uh, made appearances down there. And some, you know, young gal, she's dancing around with the bear. And I don't know, you know, my gosh, I, I hope she didn't get mauled or anything. I never read about that. But, um, and then the boardwalk uh, also was, was a, a big attraction, pretty crowded. And I don't think I mentioned this, but the, uh, the math, um, about 3,500 people came on boats a day and add that to the 1,500 that came by train. You had 5,000 people uh, down in little Chesapeake Beach, all of them, you know, having a good time. And uh, it, it's interesting um, to look at the language also, which is, which is intriguing to me. And you see the people on, on the right uh, picture there, they were bathing. That's how it was advertised, saltwater bathing, not swimming. If they were on their stomach and flapping their arms and legs, they were swimming. But other than that, they were just bathing. And uh, that's the term that was used back then. Oh, also, um, the place was like a huge carnival. There were all kinds of games, uh, you know, that you played, uh, won prizes. There were photo studios. 
um, and, and all that stuff. And thank us for the photo studios because we got a lot of pictures at the museum from those studios. Uh, it's really cool. Now the accommodations there, they want from anything from this, uh, um, at that time, five-star hotel, all the way down to uh, tents. And uh, people, it wasn't unusual, people bring their own tent and pitch it and, and camp out. Uh, and of course, in the center there is the High View Hotel is one of many, kind of like bed and breakfasts, uh, they're mid-priced. Um, the uh, Big Belvedere, uh, it burned down in 1923. That was uh, kind of a calamity. Uh, interesting story about the Belvedere. They realized that they were losing ground on the fire. So they called Washington, D.C. Fire Department. And D.C. sent um, fire trucks there. But uh, by the time they got there, they were looking at a, at a smoking basement, you know, foundation there. Just, they just couldn't save it. And the, the, the cause of the fire was not the Belvedere's fault. It was from another building that was burned down a couple of blocks away. And the embers floated and landed on the roof of the Belvedere. And uh, uh, down, they just couldn't, couldn't fight the fire. And that happened quite often. But um, uh, everybody appeared to have a good time. And, uh, you know, they, they wrote a lot of letters and sent a lot of postcards home. This is a, a cute little slide I put together. I call it the Doppler effect. Uh, and you can read about it here. We have a couple of questions if you yes, if this is a good spot. Good spot. There was back in the start, we were, you know, looking at this resort, and there was a question about are there is this the onlyest resort that people could come to, or were there competing resorts? And this was one of of several. The closest thing to compete with this quite frankly, was Atlantic City. And there were other ones, little uh, small ones, uh, Tolchester up, uh, up near Baltimore, uh, a couple others, but they were nothing like the Speak Beach. And I'm gonna jump in too. There were uh, a few beaches that were in the Anna, Anna Arundel County area, like Mayo Beach that went back there. And then even one that went back called Highland Beach. Mm -hmm. um, that pre was was before this uh, Chesapeake Beach one. So there were several uh, beaches in that area, but they weren't as built up, like Mike said, you know, as much as this was. And this was the only one that you could get by train, get to by train. Okay. And uh, our our speaker last month, John Kagu, who has uh, done an ex extensive visit of all kinds of uh, rail stations throughout the East Coast and even beyond, um, just messaged that there was Leesvania Lees Park in Woodbridge uh, was a resort, but it was not like the Chesapeake Beach. Mm. There's one more question and then we'll keep on going. Um, yeah. So beside the beach railway station, are there any other structures from the railroad that still remain? No. Uh, as far as buildings, there are none. Um, the closest thing we have is Armager's Warehouse uh, at the Pendel, what used to be the Pendel Station. Uh, it was just a freight warehouse. It was 20 by 20 little building there, but it's, it's uh, all that's left is foundation and collapsed in on itself. So yeah, really nothing. So back over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and I, you know, I'm just a little tongue in cheek here, um, you know, about the Doppler effect and uh, how sound fades when things go away. But the fading was not only a sound, but uh, the railway visitors and the town. Now, um, to look at the um, prosperity of the town, it looks kind of like an EKG. You know, it had peaks and valleys and, and like that uh, old saying excuse me, is when a railroad dies, so does the town. And uh, that was a concern. Uh, people wouldn't be coming to Chesapeake Beach because the train didn't come there anymore and all that stuff. Interesting about the train, though. The train was also a commuter train, and they even had commuter tickets 
they called them commutation tickets. And people, um, there were two families uh, that I know of where, you know, granddad, he went to high school in Washington, D.C. and rode the train in from Chesapeake Beach every day, which uh, that, that, was, that was pretty interesting. We think of it just for vacation goers, but the train ran every day and, and people used it to commute uh, actually into D.C. And they, they got a special price for that, for the ticket. And um, eventually they couldn't uh, keep the train running. April 15th, 1935, precisely at 11.50, the last train pulled out. Now, let's fast forward to today. And the uh, friends of the Chesapeake Beach Railway Museum and the staff, uh, every April 15th or as close to it as we can get on a Sunday, we have a little ceremony there commemorating the, the leaving of the last train, the departure. And it's, um, it's timed uh, so that the um, conductor, John Redesell, my friend, uh, it, precisely at 1150, he gives the all aboard and uh, two blasts on the whistle. And um, that, uh, we ring the bell, the big station bell, we ring that once for every year, 35 times that the train ran. Uh, it's, a, it's a neat little ceremony. Um, it's about 15 minutes long. And um, it, uh, it just sensitizes everyone to, uh, you know, the, the, the railway uh, going away. Um, in addition, uh, after that, we take a short, a little piece of time there and uh, honor the uh, two uh, crew members that died in a head-on collision um, in uh, 1900, actually, July, um, of two, uh, two trains ran into each other head-on at the only blind curve on the line. And um, uh, one crew got out and lived, the other crew stayed in the cab and, and were killed. Um, so uh, we, we honor them, too. It's a neat little ceremony. And, uh, and then we have punch and cookies. So, all righty. So, but wait, there's more. Gee, where have we seen that before? Tune to the next slide for your answers. Here it is, yes and no. And I made a mistake here um, where it says three former Chesapeake Beach steam locomotives and roundhouse. They only purchased two. I stand corrected on that. So um, they only purchased two locomotives. And then um, uh, they converted from steam to diesel power in the late 40s, early 50s. And the exact date was they started going to diesel in 1946 actually and they purchased three uh, diesel electric swishers um, one of them was a, a GE uh, a little yard switcher and then uh, they bought a Whitcomb a 1944 Whitcomb and then they bought a Alco an Alco I think it's an RS1 I don't know um, I've looked at it as best I can determine, whatever. But uh, then they, everything was torn up. Anything that could be sold was sold. Some rolling stock was sold and the rest scrapped. And Chris DeGrace, our collections manager, just last week sent John and I and a couple other folks an article from the Evening Star magazine. It was the or Evening Star newspaper. It was a newspaper of record for Washington, D.C. for years. But anyway, it talked about the demise of the rolling stock of the Chesapeake Beach Railway in how they disposed of them. And they took, you know, they took the car off the trucks, stripped them out and everything else, and then uh, turned the cars upside down, lit them on fire and burned them uh, to get rid of them and then scrapped all the metal. Uh, uh, so... Uh, they, they scrapped uh, quite a few cars like that. 
That was pretty interesting reading about how they did it. Um, then, um, like I said, yes and no. The uh, East Washington contracted with Pepco. And this is interesting too. There was a, the, the old, old um, transportation company in DC was uh, Capital Transit. I don't know if anybody remembers those buses. But uh, anyway, um, Capital Transit used to move coal from the, the Chesapeake Junction to the Pepco power plant in Anacostia. And the East Washington Railway came and said, we've got a better deal. We can do it better for you. Big legal fight. But uh, the East Washington won out. And um, they moved coal all day long from Benning Yard into Anacostia power plant there, the Pepco power plant. Now, um, they did that. And also along the line between Chesapeake Junction and the district line back where the roundhouse was in Sea Pleasant, there were industries there too. And um, they serviced those industries. Uh, uh, F.L. Watkins was a big coal company and they ran coal down to F.L. Watkins uh, down in Sea Pleasant. They also ran one heck of, they, they ran boxcars full of liquor uh, to a big liquor warehouse in DC down that line. But they made a ton of money. They just, uh, in 1970, um, they made uh, $210,000 and they spent $90,000 as expenses. So they were way in the black and they paid off a lot of what the Chesapeake Beach Railway uh, had, had encumbrances. They didn't really have to, but they did to keep peace in the family. They made a lot of money. And then in 1973, of course, the plant converted to oil from coal, but um, then the, um, we ran into the oil embargo and that kind of kind of set things on their ear. So, and they went out of business in uh, 1973. And I, I want to chit chat a little bit about uh, some things that I want to talk about real quick, if you don't mind. And that is the, um, the uh, fantastic job that um, my full-time counterparts are doing. Um, Corrine and Chris. Uh, Chris, as collections manager, she found somebody who had an original 1902, I believe it was, um, hand drawn by um, uh, graphics people and authored by their, by their civil engineer a guy named Bierbauer, the original architectural, I can't say architectural, but anyway, uh, map of the Chesapeake Beach Railway from Chesapeake Junction all the way to Chesapeake Beach. The thing is 33 feet long. It's an incredible find. And if you wanted to know anything about grades, about the construction of the railway, any of that stuff, it's right there, uh, and uh, excuse me, um, if it wasn't for Corrine and Chris, we wouldn't have that thing. And we just got all kinds of all kinds of stuff from from that. So I got a tip of the hat to those folks. So, but the re the um, resources that we have there uh, are just incredible. We have original communications, even between the yardmaster and the owner of the railway, saying the owner of the railway saying, I want this car burned. And the yard master says, well, can, how about me cutting it in half and keeping it half for a tool shed? And the owner saying, I said, burn it. And they, oh, come on back and forth. And finally they got to keep a half a car for a tool shed, which we have actually at the, at the museum now. It's been refurbished, uh, it's the Dolores. So um, yeah, I just wanted, I wanted to get that in before questions popped up. I also wanted to go ahead and add too, um, is the, uh, in discussing with the Dolores rail car that's in the back of the museum, that is one half as Mike mentioned, and it is a parlor car. 
and it's the last known remaining piece of rolling stock that we are aware of from that particular railway. But the night before, uh, back in 1979, 19, I think it was 1979, um, they went to go get another parlor car, the San Juan, which was a really fancy parlor car on this railway. Somebody burnt it to the ground. So they ended up picking up just one half of the Dolores rail car. So that's how we ended up coming into possession of that. And then the other thing I wanted to mention, the Chesapeake Beach Railway Museum station slash de depot, depending on how you want to frame it, is protected under Federal Law 106. So it is on the National Historic Trust. So it, it's, it is protected. And that happened in uh, 1980. So just wanted to throw that in as well. So we do have a question about the amusements being built on a pier instead of on land. Yes. And ah. folks <laughs> wanted to have a little conversation about that. Love to. Um, uh, there's two things about building on a pier. Number one, you don't have to buy the land. And number two, you don't have to pay taxes on it. Hmm. So. If you have your druthers, <laughs> what would you do, Mr. Businessman? But anyway, that's that's the way it was. And um, then when the hurricane came through in 30 something, they said, we can't sustain this stuff. They salvaged some things, moved them up to dry land. Uh, and the resort itself was purchased by another company. I think they were from New York or somewhere. And um, then they built the amusement park up on on dry land called it Seaside Park. And it uh, it stayed uh, until the early 70s, I do believe. Um, we, we have many people that come in and say, gosh, you know, I remember as a kid going to the, you know, going to the amusement park. And uh, we, we do have a DVD of, uh, uh, that was taken, made in the 60s from home movies. We have a DVD that we sell in the gift shop for uh, uh, about the, it's, it's really neat. Um, people look at that and they say, oh my gosh, I remember that, and this kind of stuff. They had the saltwater pool, a huge, a huge pool, and it's, it was saltwater. It was brought in from the bay, uh, filtered, um, and um, then, you know, recirculated back into the bay. And uh, that was extremely popular. But then again, here we go with the cars. Uh, people could go other places, and, and that place eventually folded, and it, now it's uh, all townhouses. But the carousel, which was built in 03, still runs. It's in a Prince George's County Park up near Upper Marlboro called Watkins Park, and it's the original carousel from Chesapeake Beach from way back when. It's, it's the, the second original one. The or first the one was actually, one. yeah, right. The second one was um, on the boardwalk over the water was burnt down on Halloween night. And I think the date you mentioned 1903 or something like that was, and then the second one was built. And um, that's the one that's at regional at Watkins Regional Park. And it still has all of its internal original um, guts, if you will, or machinery. It's very cool. Mm, cool. We don't have any other questions in the chat, so. You mean we did that good of a job? Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so we'll, we'll continue. <laughs> yeah, one last thing. And this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any guesses from the audience there? What is that number? Well, behind door number one, it's my membership number. I'm one of you guys and gals. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was there for, gosh, a member for years and years and years and years. And being an astute guy, I let it lapse and <laughs> got back in again. But uh, we'd like to thank you for the opportunity. You guys were great. We, putting this together was just a, a, a good time. Um, glad to do it. And, you know, come down and see us. My gosh, the museum is, is absolutely stunning now. It's, it's just beautiful. 
And we, and we're almost done with the new exhibits, uh, pretty pretty much done with that. But I, I would also like to give another shout out to Krista Grace because she's the one who finds all these really neat things. Um, and that map, that um, the elevation map that Mike was was talking about earlier, that, that was her find that she was actually um, uh, able to go and get. I'm the one who pushes the money button. So, <laughs> but anyway, it's Krista Grace who gets all that. And I wanted to thank everybody uh, and the organization also for thinking about us and asking us to do this. It was our pleasure. Thank you so very much. We're delighted to have you here and we've learned a lot. And I still like the fall for a great time to go to the beach. So I'll just give another plug for going to the Chesapeake Beach Railway Museum and Please, see yeah. their great new exhibit. And uh Parking's not a problem. It, it's interesting. I don't know how many people have, have been down there, but the Rod and Reel, they built a four-story parking garage on the property there. Used to, used to be able to get, excuse me, about 270 cars on the lot. Well, then they built this new garage and they can get 750. And there was a lot of discontent in the town about, oh my God, you're going to build this thing that looks like going to look like something in Washington, D.C. or something. But what the Rod and Reel did is they procured from us photographs of the beach back in the 20s, you know, uh, beach scenes, uh, bathing beauty scenes, everything. And they blew them up into murals that literally cover the building and disguise it. And it is just, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing now. It's a, it's hard to guess that it's a, that it's a parking garage because of the artwork that was done on it. The uh, owner spent a little over a million dollars to do that, but it, it's beautiful. But we could talk all night about Chesapeake Beach. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not going to. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Kareem. It's Thank been a you. wonderful adventure you, for us. Oh, and great. thanks for our, our audience, our members, and our guests. And just to remind you that all of our, our sessions have been recorded and they're available on the DC NRHS website. I'm sorry, the YouTube channel. Great. And we've got a new website. So check us out. Thanks, everybody, for Thank attending. You. We had a great time tonight. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Kareen. Um, and I can't end without thanking Darren and Jim for their part yes. in helping us go through the logistics.